gentlemen, welcome to the main event. Let's get ready to rumble! Y'all ready for this? What we have, folks, is the ability now to have the FM stereo multiplex signal done over a network in a data configuration that's very affordable. And I, I can see people on the audience going, Frank, where's the rub? Well, I gotta tell you something, because I know right away people are gonna say, um, to do this, uh, how are you doing it at such a low bit rate? In a moment, I'm gonna call Hans up here because he can give you a simple overview of the codec that's involved that Hans and his uh, colleague, Mateus, put a lot of work into. Um, and I think it's the subject of a, of a paper, I believe. Um, and Hans will give you a bit more detail, but I want to tell you that for those, because I see some of my audio processing buddies out in the audience, they're probably going, Codec, Frank, you've talked about codecs, no codecs and processing, so there must be overshoots. Nope, no overshoots. And by the way, the integrity of the MPX signal is perfect. But if I could have a moment, I'd like to call Hans up. Hans, if you want to take just a moment and give a simple overview about what we're doing with micro MPX. Yes, uh, good morning. Um, micro MPX is a MPX codec, is an MPX codec which is uh, uses a specially designed codec which is optimized for use on FM. Which means that instead of what normal codecs do, introducing things like holes in the spectrum, pre-ringing, post-ringing, all kinds of the nasty uh, codec artifacts, this artifact, th this codec, basically, uh, if it adds anything, it adds white noise, which sounds exactly like FM reception uh, noise, except the level is very low and you're never going to notice it at 320 kilobit. Uh, we did uh, extensive listening tests with a few dozen people. Even at 256, almost nobody could hear the difference, but at the 320, it was really impossible to tell the difference. And the codec has actually been improved since the tests have been performed. Um, yeah, as you will be able to see, indeed, the peak level and also all the benefits that you have from using composite are still there. For example, in the composite signal, if you use a processor like an Omnia 11, an Omnia 9, an Omnia 7, an Omnia 9 SG, uh, the peaks in the demodulated signal are actually louder than 100% modulation, and that also survives the codec. Uh, pilot protection is still over 90 dB, uh, the RDS signal is perfect, and yeah, that's it basically. Thank you, Hans. I'm sure there's going to be a lot more um, detailed questions from people in the audience either now or throughout the week, and we're myself, Hans, Corny, and uh, our new associate, Brian Kirkin, who we picked up as a free agent signing. Um, Brian did not want to sign with the Cleveland Browns, thank God. And, um, you know, uh, so we'll be able to answer all your questions. So this is one example of the continued disruptive innovation that happens here at the TELUS Alliance booth. So while I realize that, you know, most press conferences necessarily don't go all that long, I'm going to borrow a page from an influence of mine because there's just one more thing. Ladies. Introducing G-Force with the perfect D-Clipper. More loudness than allowed by law. There's some folks that have been asking us for a period of time, um, this has this is independent of the micro MPX. Uh, Omni 11 here at the show has been uh, given an update, and actually, it's more than just an update. We're introducing right now something called GeForce. It's um, there's actually two things going on with Omni 11. There is a, a version 3.0 software update that brings RDS and a few other utilitarian items to Omni 11. GeForce is the next step in that. Basically, what this is, this is a brand new audio processor, except you don't have to buy a, a new box. 
So um, what we've been able to do here is not only have we um, kicked up, you know, kicked it up a notch with regard to the sound processing algorithms, but um, my cohort in crime over here, uh, if some people have, if they've alluded to me as the, as you know, they, they around the office will say, they, they'll say, hey, there's, there's the boss. I'll say, no, Bruce Springsteen isn't here. But if I was to be Bruce Springsteen, this is my beloved Clarence Clemens because Corny, uh, Cornelius Gould has put so much time and effort not only into the dynamics, which when you hear it, it's going to blow your doors off, but Corny has also spent a considerable amount of time um, spending time with regard to the dynamics and things, something known as a watermark. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we've got a little thing that, you know, we've got this little love affair with a ratings company. So um, Corny's done a tremendous amount of work here, and we're now just beginning to collate additional new data because just when they thought it was safe to go back in the water, folks, uh, we're kicking that up a notch or two as well. Corny, if you can take just a moment or so, just give a real quick uh, uh, gloss over what G-Force is all about. And then, you know, I, I want to invite everybody around to the, um, that side of the kiosk because we'll be able to give a, a before and after demonstration as to how everything performs with regard to micro MPX. Thanks. Um, G-Force is basically the, the culmination of about uh, three, three years of work researching and following, following up on some goals that I've been trying to uh, reach since we introduced Omni 11 five years ago. So I've done a lot of time researching and made a lot of improvements um, in, with regards to dynamics and, and, and new concepts such as dynamic equalization so you don't have to overly squash your, your multi-band AGCs to get consistency and, and you can get more loudness, more open, less intermod distortion. So it'd be great, come by and check it out and listen. And as Frank says to, as well, uh, GeForce really incorporates a lot of the concepts that I introduced a year ago uh, when I gave my paper on how audio processing can help your Ar Arbitron. Be here with us this, uh, today. So the strength going forward from Omnia Steam Division of the Telos Alliance, uh, we all answer to a 750-pound steam engine by the name of Eastwind. But seriously, it's it's the work of people like Corny. You know, um, Hans gave just a, a simple overview, but. This is the stuff that's going to raise the bar in this medium. And if we're not able to do what we can to raise the medium uh, in broadcasting, this is how radio, as we know it, is going to remain a very viable and competitive force. And our drive is to benefit radio. This isn't so much about the Telos Alliance or, you know, some crazy thing that, you know, we're trying to do. Our drive, you know, and when you think back on it, all the way from 1985 when Steve introduced the Telos 10 to today, our desire is to do what we can do to better radio. So with that in mind, if any of you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, if not, you know, we've got muffins here. You can toss them. Uh, you know, we can have a food fight. Angie's giving me a look like, Frank, you're going to stand in the corner. Okay. But uh, happy to take any questions, and if not, I want to thank each and every one of you for making the time to stop by and hear our story. Look at me. I'm between two of the funnest engineers you'll ever find in your life. First, we have Jason Mercurio. Hey, Jake, how are you? Great to see you. Good, good. Did I say your name right? Yes, sir. All right. <laughs> so, Jason, uh, you work at, uh, well, tell me where you work at. I work over at Universal Studios in the Radio Broadcast Center. You got the fun job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love it. It's great. We have uh, work with a bunch of different radio stations from all over the country, all over the world sometimes, and uh, we do about 300 plus a year. So, um, here at the show, what have you found that's interesting? Um, mostly the stuff over at Sennheiser, oh. all the different broadcast microphones, their you, wireless capabilities. You know, I'm using a Sennheiser microphone right here. Good man. I, I, just, I just bought it for a low handling noise. Excellent, yeah. excellent. Yeah, I love it. I mean, they just have quality products, some of the best in the business. Yeah, good deal. This is Bob Page. You've met Bob before on our podcast this week in Radio Tech. Hey, Bob. How are you? Good. You working at Universal too? Love Universal. <laughs> Been there for 25 years. And you run the, what, the studio there? Yeah, the radio broadcast center right in the middle of the Hollywood section of the Universal's Park. You know, I'm delighted to see you here, and that brings me to my question. I, I know you're looking around at gear, but what's the NAB about for you? Uh, obviously, to come check out all the new gear, but it's also great. It's the one time a year I get to see all my old friends face-to-face -face and make that connection. Yeah. 
it, you know, a lot of folks, their bosses won't let them come or won't pay for it, and there's, there is a lot of value here in networking with other engineers and seeing your buddies and making new friends. Yeah, absolutely. Jason and I were talking about it earlier today, that this is the one time a year you can come and you make that face-to-face -face connection, and it's going to carry over because you're going to have conversations later, and you're going to go, I completely remember that person. We sat down. We had a conversation about this, that, and the other. So, yeah, it's, it's a must-go-to show. Cool. Good deal. Hey, thanks for both of you guys for coming by the Telos booth. I'm Kirk Harnack for the Telos Alliance. Hey, I'm here with Alex Gazorik. Hi, Alex. How are you? I'm very well. How about yourself? You've been a guest on uh, a show of ours yes, before. Yes, I have. But we're here, uh, well, we're, we're doing some Telos news right now, but you've seen some cool things around uh, the NAB today. Yes, I, a lot about VR, virtual reality, all around the yeah, place yeah. with microphones and cameras and all that kind of fun stuff. But also, going back to what I call some basics. Um, a lot of us go out and do remotes and to various locations. My company, we actually go out all the time, about 110 times per year. Whoa. Yet we don't have our own remote truck yet. <laughs> so you're, yet. are you in the market? Yes, and it's such an interesting experience learning it all over again. I've been able to operate in remote trucks on the East Coast, West okay. Coast, so on and so forth, but I haven't had actually the opportunity to shop for it myself to shop for one. Yeah. And it's such a learning experience, not only with the new technologies that integrate into trucks, oh. MADI, audio over IP, all the different flavors, but also just learning the different things of air conditioning. Oh. I'm from Phoenix, Arizona. How to deal with that and making sure in an audio-centric truck that's of a smaller size of how challenging that still is today. Oh. It's, because uh, a lot of us are looking at the Dodge Sprinters, the, mm -hmm. the Ford Transit size, how much of a challenge it is to still get the amount of BTUs of air conditioning into those units, but still have it be quiet on the inside. Been very educational seeing all these different companies and the way that they, they manipulate air uh -huh. just to come into the truck, or not by just putting the air conditioning unit on the top and you're just going, oh, that's not gonna work. But it's a learning process, which I find fascinating. And I'm, I'm really intrigued to go through all those steps because hopefully by a year from now, knock on some wood, that I'll be able to say, this is who we picked and why. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. But really, it's really interesting when you go from the, like those Ford Transits and those Dodge Sprinters to yeah. just one size larger, just a little bit larger, how much easier it is to do all these different things. Really? Yes. Okay. Okay. So there's that, still a challenge of, of working in that smaller space. Yeah. Probably not so much for the video guys because they can deal with all the air noise, but for us it's a challenge and it's a learning experience. And, and, and that's one of the things which I find very interesting for myself this time. That is fascinating. And we're out of time, but you know what? We're going to be back tomorrow to talk with Alex about another audio technology called upmixing. Stick around yeah. for that. Hey, we're with Rob Ashard from, where are you from, Rob? UK, just UK. outside well, London. I should have guessed from the accent. <laughs> so, Rob, you've been talking with me about uh, some equipment, uh, uh, Axia gear going into the UK, no, oh, into a secret island location. Indeed, yes. yes. We're, so we're looking at uh, Axia consoles, yeah. probably Radius, uh, in three studios. So that's why I'm here to have a chat with you today. Cool. And so uh, have you worked with Axia gear before yourself? No, I haven't. But I've uh, watched a lot of your videos on it. It, okay. it, it seems incredibly intuitive. And uh, so it seems, that, you know, it seems like they're tearing out a lot of stuff and we need to have a fairly quick installation and, and Axia seems to be a, a, a very good way of doing that. Now Rob, you and I are friends on Facebook and I know yeah. you are some have been involved with Radio Caroline and I think that's a fantastically interesting subject. Can you give us a, just a little insight into uh, Radio Caroline or your involvement? Well, sadly I never served at sea as some of the people did. Radio Caroline had three decades of, of, of operation. Basically mm -hmm. it turned up in the 60s and was part of the UK, you know, the swinging 60s pop revolution right. And everything right. and there were a whole load of other pirate ships and some on forts in the sea and all sorts oh um, it then re-emerged in the 70s which is when I listened to it as a teenager because I was uh, in 76 I was 16 and it, it re-emerged as an album station which was great and it was no nothing like anything else we had and then it came back again that ship literally sunk yeah, with yeah. no loss of life uh, thankfully and then it came back from a fabulous 300 foot Icelandic trawler with about a 280 foot mast on board uh, a 50 kilowatt amplifier oh, transmitter wow, wow. with the most stonking signal you can imagine <laughs> uh, and w arguably one of the first optimods we'd heard in Europe as well. Yeah. 
Well, those amplifase transmitters, they, they consumed a lot of power, but boy, they could walk and talk. Oh, it was lovely, yeah. It was, it was a huge signal. So they, again, it was sort of an album station and got a bit more poppy uh, in the mid uh, in the mid 80s. Anyway, we're now, that's, uh, it was outlawed out of practical use, basically. It became very difficult to operate. So uh, we now are an internet station, but we have a lot of the DJs that served in the 70s and the 80s at sea. So it's, uh, and it's still an album station, but playing new rock as well. And new we would find that station where on the internet? Uh, www.radiocaroline.co.uk yeah, and we've got a stream, we have a time delayed stream that's correct so the breakfast show goes out in the US Perfect. as well as the uh, UK streams. That's great. Thanks so much Rob, appreciate you being with me. Take good, care. Good to see you. Have a good show. I'm talking with Ewan Roos at the Telos Alliance. Hey Ewan, how are you? Hey Kirk, I'm good. Uh, we have a new product here in the Telos Alliance booth, the Zipstream R2. What can you tell me about this box? What, what is it? It's our latest um, audio processor and encoder for streaming. It can do up to eight streams. So eight audio, what, well, eight audio inputs? Eight audio programs, actually, to yeah. be precise. Yeah. And then, what, process each one? It can process each one in multiple ways, uh -huh. encode each one in multiple ways, and stream them, send them out to um, for streaming. Okay, so let's say I've got a station now, and I've been stream. I've got a computer doing an MP3 stream for my legacy listeners. I've got a, a newer service. I'm doing AAC over that. Uh, why would I need this box uh, over what I'm doing now? This box uh, in one RU can replace uh, all those computers and all that equipment. It's a lot more cost effective because you don't have to manage multiple computers and multiple devices. Oh, okay. So in, in one RU, I can, what, AES in? Uh, what, what are the options? You can do AES in. Uh, you can also do the live wire. You can make MP3 streams, AAC streams. We also have the XHEAC codec. Well, I've heard about that. What does that do? That's, uh, that's the newest codec from Fraunhofer. It's, uh, it's a very high quality codec. It works really well, especially at low bit rates. Okay. Now, does it, is, it, is it stuck at a low bit rate, or is it, no. it can go anywhere? It can go anywhere, but it performs particularly well at lower bit rates. Okay, okay. It, especially compared to AAC and other codecs. Now, explain quickly this notion of sending uh, streams that I make to different providers, a Shoutcast, Icecast, and then this new thing, this Apple HLS. Well, th those are a little bit different. So. Um, Apple HLS is an example of adaptive streaming, uh, yep. where you can encode the same uh, audio at different bit rates, which allows a client to uh, then select the appropriate bit rate for the current conditions. And that happens automatically at, at the client, yeah? That happens automatically, yes. You know, you know I've been doing a bit of this. Uh, on my Android phone, I have a, a, a client that works fine, and, and uh, it's amazing. It, you, you start it, it starts fast, and plays great audio. That's right. Good deal. Yep. Ewan, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Kirk. We're here with Cam Cornelius. Hello, Cam. Hey, Kirk. How you doing? I'm great. It's great, great to see you great here. Great to see you. I know. Cam is a voice actor, among other things. He does voice acting. Mm -hmm. So you're here at NAB looking for voice actor stuff. Looking for voice actor stuff. Headphones. Like really loud headphones. What? Really loud headphones. What? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, headphones, microphones. Yeah, I hear you found a good microphone. I did. As a matter of fact, last year at NAB, uh, Yellow Tech has this little microphone called the IXM, which records. And right. I was really impressed with uh, this little algorithm that they have built into it called LEA, L-E-A. And it, you can talk very quietly into it, or really loud. Yes. I probably just did uh, probably, hello. Probably, uh, hello, <laughs> hello, 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 hello. Anyway, uh, and it, it's a great voice leveler, but it will bring up your voice or bring down your voice, yeah. but keep that background noise just at a very minimum. Yeah. And that really impressed me. And yeah, you, you told me you were experimenting with it, and I was. you had uh, an HVAC <laughs> unit come on in the background? Come on in the background, outside of a building, and this huge HVAC unit comes on, and I thought it would make anything unusable. I went back into uh, post-production. Yeah. I couldn't even hear the thing turn on, and the voice was crystal clear. It was amazing. So this audio noise reduction engine got rid of that. So now you can do voiceovers like from the basement of a Jiffy Lube? Well, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> the one thing I didn't, I didn't like was that it was all in this little mic microphone. Okay. Yeah. And so what Yellow uh, Tech did is come out with a little microphone interface called a Puck 2 okay. uh, that builds upon their existing Puck line. And uh, it sounds like a little 
a train or something. The, I'm taking the puck line to New York. Um, anyway, the building, <laughs> building on the puck two, uh, they put the El Lea engine in the puck two now. So I'm really excited to try that because I can hook up a Sennheiser 416 or a Neumann or whatever mic I want. Oh, any into, mic you want. Any mic this. I want into this thing wow. and record right into Audition or Audacity or whatever I'm doing. And, and so for a uh, traveling voice actor, yeah. uh, for like I'm doing now, when you get into a hotel room, you get into a hotel room, you... Uh, set up a pillow fort around your mic and try to get all the noise you can out. And, and, and you're not in your studio anymore. You're not in a controlled environment. Yeah, yeah. And so something like this interface could be an amazing thing if it's able to push down that that noise that you don't like yeah. and level your voice in in an uncontrolled environment. So this Puck 2 puts out USB to your your puts out laptop. USB to your computer okay. or it'll it'll actually put out AES into uh, an audio board. Uh, so if your studio at home yeah. or wherever you are is less than perfect, yeah. you can also it's use awesome. it as a... Oh, so it's good for home yeah, too. It's good for home, home, home use as well. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, very excited about it. Wow, now I can run those uh, those noisy computers uh, while I'm recording audiobooks. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll try, maybe, yeah. But I, I think I think this this little uh, Puck 2 might actually help with something like that. Okay. If you have a fan that turns on on a computer, until we get into the, the, the really good fanless computer age, a few are out there, but occasionally you'll have a fan turn on on a computer, and something like this yeah. would help you. Now, it sounds like my dream of having a voiceover booth at the end of the runway will finally come true. Yes, you live near the airport. <laughs> Get a puck, too. <laughs> That's right. right. Cam, thanks so much for being with us. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much, uh, Kirk. I'm Kirk Harnack for the Telos Alliance.